Red Bull's been searching for a solution to a big and obvious problem. Who the hell should be our other F1 drivers next year? The process of resolving that has been going on for what feels like an eternity. It revived and ended Daniel Ricciardo's F1 career and has heaped pressure on the underperforming Sergio Perez. It might be nearing an end though, with the growing prospect of Liam Lawson stepping up to the senior team alongside Max Verstappen, and the ideal driver to complete the two Red Bull lineups is currently impressing somewhere else. The fact Red Bull has struggled for a clear driver plan with its two F1 teams is an indictment of its lack of strategy. Long-time motorsport advisor Helmut Marko heads the junior programme with a unique approach to driver scouting. If he happens to be watching and a driver stands out, they're suddenly flavour of the month. It's facilitated some wildcard moves and some fun stories. While that's not a sustainable action plan and is something Red Bull is trying to change longer term, ironically bringing in the person we think could be Red Bull's next F1 driver would be exactly that kind of move. Franco Colapinto wasn't really on anybody's radar until he suddenly got on the grid in place of Logan Sargent at Williams and immediately impressed in front of everybody. Colapinto's turned heads against the experienced and well-regarded Alex Albon. He scored points twice, caught the eye with some bold driving and taken F1 in his stride. In fact, the confidence he has and the manner in which he's handled being thrown in at the deep end makes him the perfect Red Bull Junior prospect. The combination of speed and mental resilience is always well sought after, but what Colapinto's doing is particularly appealing to someone like Marco. There is serious interest in Colapinto from Red Bull. Before we explain that and how likely we think it is that a proper move will be made for him, we should get into how good Colapinto's really been since his sudden chance to replace Sargent emerged between the Dutch and Italian Grand Prix just after the summer break. It started solidly with Colapinto looking around a couple of attempts slower than Albert at Monza, although he qualified further off after a mistake in Q1. So he should have made Q2, but had a good race drive from 18th to 12th. That put him pretty much at Sargent's peak right away, and he quickly exceeded it. Colapinto's first points came next time out in Azerbaijan, which was impressive for two reasons. He didn't know the track, and he had a crash in FP1 that could have robbed him of confidence. Instead, he was right on Albon's pace, got to Q3, and even outqualified his teammate after Albon's bizarre mishap with a fan still being attached to the car. Colapinto then drove a calm race and was opportunistic late on to score good points in 8th. After another strong comparison with Albon in Singapore, despite missing a suspension upgrade, Colapinto was back in the top 10 in the United States. The sprint format meant he only had one practice session to learn the track and had a spin in main qualifying, but he executed a good race on an alternative strategy to bag another point. Mexico was Colapinto's first real setback. He lost confidence in the rear in qualifying and had a chunky gap to Albon of 0.369 seconds, easily his biggest deficit since his last minute debut at Monza. The race was going well until he had a scrape with Lawson that Colapinto was blamed for, although the 10 second penalty made no difference to finishing 12th. Given how reactive F1 and especially Red Bull can be when judging drivers, it's unfortunate to have had a slightly worse weekend at the end of this run. But with the pace he had, there's no reason why Colapinto couldn't have been a point scorer yet again with a cleaner weekend, and that high ceiling is being noticed. Should Perez remain in terminal decline and Lawson make a good case for himself for the rest of 2024, then promoting Lawson and bringing in Colapinto as teammate to Yuki Tsunoda at RB makes perfect sense. It's the ideal combination of moves to reposition Red Bull's lineup across its two teams to something more youthful and promising, with an eye on the future and, let's face it, a better performance level in the short term. But it's not super simple or cheap to drop Perez given he has a contract and big backing. And the commercial element is significant because of the sponsorship Red Bull has from Perez's primary backer, Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim, who owns brands like Telmex, Claro and Telcel. But what could work in Red Bull's favour and Colapinto's is that Slim doesn't have all his eggs in the Checo basket. He actually has a direct connection to Colapinto, who is a Claro ambassador in Argentina, and the two are believed to have been in constant communication for several years, even before Colapinto joined the F1 grid and started impressing, although it hasn't translated into backing for his racing activities yet. So while Colapinto isn't going to immediately be as big a marketing asset to the Latin American market as Perez is in Mexico, especially if he's driving for the second Red Bull team, not the main one, perhaps they is a mutually beneficial arrangement to be had here. F1 is believed to be very keen on Colapinto to broaden the championship's reach in South America, and Colapinto quite cleverly is himself trying to drum up support from the region as a whole, not just from Argentinian fans and businesses. Plus, the wealth of South American sponsors that have joined Williams since Colapinto got a race seat is significant and is believed to have already added millions of dollars to its revenue. So maybe the outcome here is that Lawson replaces Perez as a Red Bull racing driver and Colapinto is the surrogate for Perez as a commercial asset. Slim could even keep backing a driver from the region and his consortium of companies can continue to be represented across four cars on the grid. It'd be a win for everybody except obviously Perez. We've laid out the logic quite clearly, so what's the holder? 
Red Bull moving for Colapinto is a real prospect in the coming weeks, but it isn't quite there yet, at least not as we record this video. Initial conversations are being had, with Williams boss James Vales not that cryptically dodging a question in Mexico about whether Colapinto could drive for RB next season by answering, if you're in sensitive negotiations, you don't give anything away at this stage, so I can't really answer that. Why would that be Vales' position if he wasn't in those sensitive negotiations? So that's about as public as it's getting right now. Senior Red Bull figures are being fairly circumspect around Colapinto because he's already on a long-term Williams contract that he needs to be released from. Colapinto signed that as part of the deal to get him in the F1 car for the rest of the season. With no other F1 prospects at the time, he didn't really have a choice, and it was a great play by Williams which guaranteed it had control over Colapinto's future in the event that, well, exactly what's happening would happen. So while Marco is inevitably talking about Colapinto when asked, because he can't help himself, he's still being fairly reserved, and Red Bull Racing boss Christian Horner doesn't want to address the subject at all if he can help it, although he has admitted Colapinto's turning heads. If Red Bull gets more shouty about how highly it rates Colapinto and how much it wants him, then the price to extract him from Williams will only increase, and extraction is the key here because Red Bull has no interest in a loan deal. That, on top of whatever it would take to drop Perez to put Lawson alongside Verstappen, would make this an expensive move. It would also mean overlooking the Red Bull Junior program, given Isaac Hadjar is fighting for the F2 title, but doesn't seem to be in serious contention for an RB race seat next year, as he hasn't massively impressed in his limited F1 opportunities so far. Red Bull HQ might balk at the idea of paying millions to sack Perez and sign someone else's junior when it's funding a vast driver academy of its own. The answer could lie in Colapinto's backing from South America, whether Carlos Slim could intervene, or simply how much Red Bull really wants this guy. But ultimately, someone is going to have to pay Williams a pretty penny for this to progress. Red Bull is not only the ideal move for Colapinto, it may be his only chance of getting on the grid full time. The other 2025 vacancy is at Audi-owned Sauber, which doesn't seem to be seriously considering Colapinto, even though there have been some conversations. We understand it's not a hugely appealing seat to Colapinto right now, given Sauber's pointless season and its long-term problems. It would take a big offer to convince him, given he could potentially waste his time there, when the alternative is to just stay at Williams with a nailed-on reserve role in 2025 and an extensive 2022 car testing program. Then he'd be poised to move into a race seat should either Albon or incoming driver Carlos Sainz leave unexpectedly early or have more flexibility to react to shifts in the driver market elsewhere. The Audi choice is boiling down to incumbent driver Valtteri Bottas, who is just waiting for project leader Mattia Bonotto's signature on their contract, and current Formula 2 points leader Gabriel Bortoletto. Nothing's really changed at the moment, with different claims doing the rounds about which way Bonotto is leaning, youth or experience. If Audi does go with the former, then Bottas could end up back at Mercedes as a reserve driver. He and the team are both open to it, as if Bottas is out of a race drive, he wants to remain on the fringes of F1 to try to get back on the grid rather than call time on his career immediately. What resolves this might actually come down to what McLaren decides to do, not Sauber. That's the key to Bottas finding out if he's got a drive or not. Bortoletto seems to be the favoured option for Audi right now, and the reason it's not as simple as just snapping him up is that he's on the books at McLaren. So there are two questions here. Will McLaren let him go, and would Bortoletto actually leave to join the slowest team on the grid? The answer to both is basically the same, yes, with the right conditions. McLaren wants a payday to let Bortoletto go, as he's clearly well regarded, and while Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri have signed up for the long term, this year's proven anything can happen in the F1 driver market. As for Bortoletto, he might sense a door opening in the medium term at McLaren, so it might be better to be patient and walk into a much more competitive seat than grab the first F1 drive that becomes available at any cost. In that sense, he's not in a completely different position to Colapinto, but Colapinto has the advantage of already showing what he can do in F1, which is more valuable nowadays than ever.